I'm going to give a brief talk kind of explaining what we were just doing a little more. And I realized there was a fair bit of guidance there, so some of us would prefer just, you know, to practice on our own and in quiet, and, but you have all the opportunity in the world to do that on your own, and hopefully there was something about this guidance that you might be inspired to integrate into your own practice that you do on your own. So I call this model of practicing that I've been developing over the, especially over the last 20 years, neurosomatic mindfulness, neurosomatic mindfulness. And the neural part is obviously that it's neuroscience and form, somatic is body. So as I mentioned at the beginning, really emphasizing developing a deeply felt physical presence of the body, the actual physicality of the body, inside and out, feeling the body physically, is like creating a strong anchor for our practice. It's like one of those, I don't know if any of us as children had one of those, or our own children had one of those blow-up dolls or clowns or this or that, and it's got some weights down in the bottom. You push it over, it comes right back up, right? So developing a deeply felt physical presence of the body anchors us. It makes it a little harder for the mind to wander, easier for the mind to come back. So that's just understanding it in simple kind of analogous terms, right? Simple analogy there. What's happening neurobiologically is that by feeling the body directly, physically, and synchronizing body and mind, which is the term my first teacher, Trung Prumshe, often used for the practice, synchronizing body and mind, body and mind in the same place at the same time, doing the same thing with awareness, synchronizing body and mind, that this actually makes a shift in the brain from the default mode network, which is responsible for the noisy brain, to the task positive network, which stabilizes our attention. Now the default mode network loves to time travel into the past and ruminate about the past, loves to time travel into the future and fantasize about the future and worry about the future. It keeps a running commentary going on about the present. It's constantly forming opinions about everything and everything. And it's constantly thinking about ourselves and thinking about others and what others think about us. We're all very familiar with that part of our brain, right? <laughs> that's the part that makes it very hard to meditate when we're first learning to meditate, right? So that's the default mode network, and it's active if we don't direct our attention. When we do direct our attention, and especially when we really synchronize body and mind, that engages what's called the task positive network, sometimes called the executive network. And those two neural networks are mutually inhibitory. So to the extent that the task positive network comes online, the default mode network is going offline. Right? So we've all had the experience, if we're really focused on doing something, like trying to thread a needle, right? Or you know, something that really requires close attention, that at least for a few seconds, the mind is completely quiet, right? Because we're really focused. And of course, when our mind's really busy, it's hard to focus. And when we become really focused, through whatever means, our mind quiets down. So we're all very familiar with that. And I believe we can learn to feel that in the body such that we can self-regulate it. So uh, type into the chat, yes, if you've ever, if you've heard of or ever practiced or done any kind of biofeedback, biofeedback. Biofeedback is like we hook ourselves up to a heart monitor and you see an analog or a digital representation of your heart rate. And just with your mind, you can learn to move your heart rate up and down. You can learn that pretty quickly, all right? Yeah, sure, people are familiar with that. There's another, and somebody mentioned neurofeedback. Okay, that's another model, neurofeedback, where instead we're hooked up to a monitor that's monitoring our brain waves. And those are used very successfully in some types of therapy. I'd love to have one of those machines to play around with myself, but they're quite expensive. <laughs> and I may get one anyway one of these days. I don't know, they're pretty expensive. If you weren't going to have a therapy practice, it probably wouldn't make sense. But at any rate, you're getting an analog or a, or a digital representation of your brain waves, and in the same way, you can learn to self-regulate your brain waves, right? So that's neurofeedback. Well, I believe, and I've been experimenting with this for years, both in my own practice and in teaching, that we can develop an internal mechanism of internal neurobiofeedback. Internal neurobiofeedback. And I actually 
had the chance to talk about that with several neuropsychologists and trauma experts recently, and they agreed with me. So we can feel that shift, right? We, we can feel when our, you know, we're aware when our mind is busy and discursive, right? And we're aware when the mind quiets down. We're also aware of how the energy moves in the body, how the body settles down, right? Right, when our body's really settled and our mind is settled, we can feel that. We can feel that body-mind synchronization and we can feel the lack of body-mind synchronization. And we can learn to tune into that and be very, quite aware of that, right? So that's the feedback part, right? Instead of watching a, an external monitor of some kind, we're getting the information from our own body we're feeling a change in our cognitive state. We're feeling a change in our physiological state, right? Because you're going to get more parasympathetic activation, right? Synchronizing body and mind, you're going to get more of the relaxation response, the parasympathetic activation. So there's physiological changes. There's cognitive changes. There's subtle changes in our emotional body, right? So we can learn to tune into all that data, and that is the data that instead of getting from an external monitor visually, we're getting it directly from our own body. And the more we develop our interoceptive awareness, our access to feeling the internal landscape of the body, and we all have that capacity, even if we've never heard of that term, that's how we know when we're tired, it's how we know when we're thirsty, when we're hungry, when we need to use the restroom, it's how we experience pain, like muscle pain, a headache, indigestion. The thing is, absent discomfort, we usually ignore the internal landscape of the body. Because again, we're very externally oriented, visually, auditorily oriented, thinking a lot. So most of us do not pay attention to the internal landscape of the body, except when there is discomfort or pain. But through practice, we can learn to really tune in to the internal landscape of the body ever more deeply and if we do that regularly with practice, then we have a higher default level of interoceptive awareness. It's kind of always there in the background. And it becomes much more accessible, which means we're getting a lot more data. And we're getting accurate data. Right? So that's the feedback part. And we're getting neurobiofeedback internally from our body through the mechanism of interoceptive awareness. And so... We can feel when the brain is making that shift from the, the noisy chatterbox part of the brain, the default mode network, to the attention stabilizing task positive network. Now, whether we can actually feel the neural networks in the brain remains a mystery. The brain doesn't have no susceptors, which are pain receptors in the brain itself. Now, the brain is where pain gets processed, the communication, but the brain doesn't have no susceptors. But even changes of the brain, we may feel that as changes of activity in the brain that we might be able to sense into in terms of the scalp and heat and so forth. So I wouldn't rule out that we can begin to actually feel the activity of neural networks in the brain. But we certainly feel the result of changes in neural activity in the brain in terms of the changes in our physiological, emotional, and cognitive state. So we're getting that information. And by developing that feedback loop, in the same way that by looking at a heart monitor, we can learn to regulate our own heart rate up and down with our mind. Or looking at a neurofeedback monitor, we can learn to adjust our brainwave states with our mind and our awareness. In the same way, we can do this internally through our own practice. Now, I, I hope you're getting the sense here. This is why I say I think this represents a revolutionary leap in our human capacities for self-regulation and really even could be an evolutionary leap, especially if children learn this early on. And it's one of the reasons why I feel, you know, some, some folks, uh, I'm probably not this community because I know Rick has a wonderful book called Neurodharma, so you all are probably pretty neuroscientifically informed and interested. Some people kind of, you know, who a long time ago go, well, why, what do we need with that neuroscience? We've known that meditation works for thousands of years, so what if it shows up on a, on a brain scan, you know? But actually, I think what we're learning from neuroscience, true, we've known a lot of this for a long time, but now we know it in new ways, and we have information that I think can, can help us bring a precision into our practice and develop profound capacities for self-regulation that some of the great yogis may have developed on in some ways, but I think we can develop it much more quickly. 
I also feel that with this type of practice, we can uh, move our practice along, you know, much more expeditiously as newcomers. I mean, many new, including myself, when I first practiced, started practicing some almost 50 years ago, I really struggled. You know, sometimes my practice went well and I felt good doing it. Other times I had always lots of resistance and I would always, you know, keep expecting I'm going to want to do it, but I didn't always want to do it. So, you know, I had a really hard time developing a strong daily practice for a long time. So I just signed up for all kinds of retreats and programs because then I know I would do the practice. But developing a daily practice was really challenging. And even on retreats, I spent a lot of time just with the chasing that monkey mind, right? Struggling with that monkey mind, as a lot of us have, I'm sure. But with this embodied approach, I believe even new practitioners can settle the mind more quickly develop a, a, a more stabilized awareness, be reaping the benefits of meditation more readily and therefore be more inspired to practice and so forth. I think for intermediate practitioners, we often find that our practice, even we've been practicing for a while, we've done some retreats, but our practice kind of plateaus. Right? It's okay, we know it's good for us, but it doesn't feel like a lot's happening. I think this can you know, take our practice to an entirely new level. And for advanced practitioners, who are interested in moving into types of non-dual awareness like Dzogchen practice or Mahamudra practice or Shikantas and Zen or choiceless awareness, this is the foundation for all of those kinds of practices and can be a very quick pathway into developing a capacity for non-dual awareness and non-dual types of meditation practice. Then, So that's one part of all this, and that's kind of the liberation angle. That's why I believe this approach can lead us more quickly into the liberating possibilities of meditation, mindfulness and awareness meditation. On the healing side, I was inviting you to be aware of an internal flow, an internal resonance, coherence. You may have tapped into it in those brief body scans. I would encourage you to try that even when you're lying down to go to sleep at night or you wake up in the morning, you can do it laying down in your bed and just do a series of those you know, five, six, seven of those, and you'll usually after five, six, or seven, you'll start to feel this flow in the body. And it can help you kind of awaken your access to that, and then you'll begin to tap into it more readily, both in your meditation practice and in your daily living. But that flow that we can tap into, it's already there, we're just not aware of it. That flow is very nurturing, healing, it heals trauma, it increases, we know neuroscientifically, increases our capacity for emotion regulation, self-regulation, and thus regulating our own behaviors, and thus being more in a driver's seat of our own life. So we can live consciously in a responsive relational mode with our life instead of getting triggered back into that fear and survival-based mode, right? The reactive mode, the less conscious mode. And so I've been teaching neurosomatic mindfulness for quite a while. If someone's interested, I have a course at where I offer my courses, heartmindinstitute.co, not .com, but .co, heartmindinstitute.co. But I also I have a community where I offer weekly practices like this and weekly uh, uh, guided, pre, pre-recorded guided practices. And so I'm, I'm constantly experimenting with this. And recently I've been developing something I'm calling regenerative self-parenting, regenerative self-parenting. And that's using this neurosomatic mindfulness to complete any of the gaps in our early childhood situation. You know, a lot of our healthy functioning as adults has to do with the level of healthy bonding and attachment that we receive really as in the first months and couple of years of our life. That healthy attachment, healthy bonding. And the, when there's gaps in that, it often brings about struggles in our adult life. So we all got what we got, right? And we could blame our parents, but, you know, they got what they got from their parents and from, you know, so it's really, it's just a human condition. So here we are as adults. Well, we can heal all of that. We can heal any and all of it. And, and I believe through developing this deeply embodied approach to practice, we can learn to cultivate a quality of really feeling held, enveloped in a womb-like energetic field that is our own being. And the more time we spend tapped into that, it actually forms, it, it heals any gaps in our attachment. It, it allows the nervous system to kind of untangle any tangles, any broken circuits, 
and we can really rewire ourselves for having a resilient foundation for healthy adult functioning, which is going to enhance our life altogether, but also then give us a greater foundation to continue our meditation practice and our spiritual development. So that's why I'm calling it regenerative repairing. Now, you'll, you'll, if you go on the web, you'll see stuff about reparenting that's most of that in psychological terms, there's some therapeutic models that are mostly about inner child work. And that's fine, but that's not what this is about. This is kind of a neurobiological reparenting by tapping into that inner flow, inner coherence. Now, it, I think it's really foundational to do this in our practice. And we're not doing it with ambition, right? I mean, we're not trying to create something here or make something up. It's just a shift of emphasis in our practice, just emphasizing the body more, really emphasizing the awareness of that internal landscape more, and just gently and slowly we'll gain greater and greater access to that internal sensory landscape. And we'll gain greater and greater access to our innate capacity that we already have for interoceptive awareness. So it's a very gentle process. Need, there needs to be no striving, no ambition. That's not helpful at all. So, but our, our, our formal practice is very important, but then we can also begin to bring it into our, our daily life practice. And really focus on presence. You know, um, uh, Eckhart Tolle's book, uh, Eckhart Tolle's book, you know, I kind of it, wrote it off many, many years ago. I thought he was just one of these kind of self-proclaimed da-da-da-da's and but I went back and read it a few years ago. It's a very profound book. And I've, I've listened to a lot of his talks now. He's, he's, definitely, he's definitely got something going on, right? Eckhart Tolle. But he really emphasizes that. He really talks about the power of presence and nowness and how to access that in the midst of our life as well as meditation. So, you know, just building on our life. Like, if, like I, have, I live in a two-story home. So every time I walk up and down stairs, I really remind myself to really just feel myself, be in the body, feeling myself, taking every step as I go up the stairs, every step as I go down the stairs. And I find lots of activities in my life and I switch them up and change them to keep it fresh, but continually trying to build presence, embodied presence into my life. And of course, there's lots of wonderful other embodiment practice we can be doing of yoga and tai chi, qigong, uh, dance. Or, you know, I'm I'm connected to the international embodiment community and it's one of so many different modalities of, of cultivating embodiment, right? So any way you can bring greater embodiment into, into your life. And there's a simple practice I'd like to offer and then we're going to open up the questions here. And this is one you can do anytime, anywhere throughout the day. And I call it stop, feel, breathe, and be. Stop, feel, breathe and be. So the first is kind of an internal command, if you will. Stop. We, we literally say that to ourselves silently. And that cuts through the discursiveness. So I would encourage everyone to try this right now. You might sit up as you do it. It might be helpful, but you don't have to. And just let yourself start thinking about stuff. Just let yourself start thinking about stuff, that what you're going to do later, stuff you forgot to do today, emails you haven't responded to. Just let your discursive mind get active, right? And at some point, I'm going to lead you through this, okay? So just let your mind run away. Okay? Stop. Feel. Okay, with feel, you drop into the body and just let yourself feel whatever is there, physically, emotionally. Just let yourself feel. And then... Breathe. Don't forget to breathe. Release the breath, the out breath. And then relax into beingness, a simple moment of pure being, pure presence. Okay, so it's stop. That cuts through the discursiveness. Feel, you drop into the body. You feel your heart. You feel your body emotionally, physically. Feel. And then you don't want to be holding your breath, so you release the breath. Breathe. Release the breath. Breathe. And then you're just dropping into being a moment of pure being. Okay, so let's try it again. Just let your mind kind of get going again, thinking about something, what the stuff you're gonna do tomorrow, stuff you gotta do later. Okay, stop. Feel. Breathe. And be. Okay, that's a very simple practice. You can do anytime, anywhere. And these little moments of of embodied presence, embodied awareness, these gaps in the discursiveness, 
as we have more and more of those throughout the day, if, as we're cultivating that in our formal practice, and then we have more and more of those gaps and moments of embodied presence, non-self, egolessness, body, embodied presence, because there's no room for the self. There's no I in those moments, right? It's just pure presence, pure beingness. Those, they, they, they begin to form like a mala. The little gaps, they string together, and they form, they're like in a mala or a rosary. And they become a continuity that's there in the background. And we begin to have a background of awareness and presence. It's always there. And it grows and grows and grows. Okay, so let's open it up to questions. So, uh, please type in, let's see, is someone's focus on small self, luckily not say the vulnerable sick, no, it's only what the... So the focus here is not on the small self at all. The focus is not on the self at all. The focus is on the body and going deeply into the body and sensory experience, which takes us deeper into our emotional body, which takes us into subtle body, which takes us into non-self. This is a very direct pathway into non-self. This is not about the small self at all. But it's not a transcendental, some people may think they can make the leap into non-dual awareness, and if you can, wonderful, but real danger is that that's some kind of spiritual bypassing, and it's very easy to delude ourselves. But you can't fool the body. The body's very trustworthy. Yeah, it's going to be very helpful with uh, any tendencies to become disassociated, absolutely. You know, the other thing about connecting with the body is it reconnects us with the earth. You know, today, the reality of climate change and global warming, you know, we're at risk of having the earth become uninhabitable for human beings and other life forms, you know, in, in the next several decades. I mean, it is a reality. And... A lot of it has to do with we have these amazing cognitive capacities and nothing wrong with that. Amazing thing about human beings. These, you know, we're, we're the most conscious, highly developed primates on the planet. And yet our incredible cognitives have become untethered from the body, untethered from the heart, and untethered from the earth. And thus we're causing a lot of damage. So we, we need to reconnect. At Heart Mind Institute, we say our work is about becoming more deeply embodied, more heart-centered, and more earth connected. So doing embodiment practice also connects us with the earth because the body is made up of the earth. Same minerals that the earth is made of. We are earthlings. We're earth beings. We are like other animals. We walk around. We're two-legged creatures. We're not stuck in the earth like plants, but we are made of the earth. We're made of the very same elements. And when we die, we're going to go back into the earth. Right? So our physical body is, we're earth beings. Our body is. Our spiritual body, that's another matter, but our earth body. So, so anyway, this deeply embodied practice connects us with the earth as well. It's very grounding. Let's see what other kind of questions. Feel free to put any questions in there. Yeah, so somebody's describing babies prior to having a developed prefrontal cortex are guided by the nervous system for the nervous system to be... Re Regulated, they, we, require basic necessary function of being seen, held, safe, secure, right? That's the early attachment and bonding. And it was probably not perfect for any of us, you know, and most of it's a mixed bag, uh, but we can heal all that. And this approach just to practice can heal all that. And we can develop, you know, a healed nervous system that uh, is the same we would have if we'd had really good, healthy attachment. And this is the work. And so for some of us, that work needs to be done in therapy and with, you know, with uh, the help of therapists. But in terms of our own self-healing, we can do a lot of self-healing uh, with this practice. Well, somebody asked about PTSD. Well, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is a result of trauma that's stuck in the body. And with very gentle work, we can gradually heal that. Now, most all trauma therapies, and I just finished interviewing Peter Levine and Bessel van der Kolk, uh, Stephen Porges, David Trelevin, all trauma experts who are on the Global Resilience Summit that starts May 24th. I'll mention that again before I forget. So following right after Rick's wonderful summit, uh, which will be the 21st to the 23rd, amazing group of people, I'll be there uh, watching all that wonderful summit. And then the following day on the 24th, the Global Resilience Summit is globalresilience.org. And Rick is on day one. Day one focuses on individual resilience, 
The second day focuses on uh, healing trauma and relational resilience. And that day we have Bessel van der Kolk, Peter Levine, other trauma experts, right? Uh, there's a day focused on societal resilience, a day focused on climate science, a day focused on systemic resilience, and we have a day focused on listening to the voices of our indigenous elders. We have seven indigenous speakers on the final day of the summit. So at any rate, yes, PTSD, for some of us, we're going to need the support of therapists and treatment, but most, almost all tra tra trauma treatment modalities that I know of are body-centered, and it basically has to do with first finding some place of workability. Now, maybe that's a place in our body that feels okay, workable. Sometimes we say safe, but I think safe is a high bar and it can be a triggering word, so I like to say workable. Right, so a place where we feel workable, we're within our window of tolerance, as Dan Siegel would say, right? Or zone of resilience. Now, we may need help with that. For some people with a trauma therapist, they may be putting their hands down on their feet or holding the hands back, you know, at the kidneys. They may be helping them having a physical experience of feeling okay and workable. But somehow we create that home base for ourselves where it's workable. And then we lean into areas of discomfort. That could be leaning into bringing awareness to parts of the body where trauma is held. It could be leaning into memories that tend to be traumatic. It could be leaning into whatever is uncomfortable for us. So we lean in a bit and then we come back to home base where we feel okay. We lean in, come back. Lean in, come back. Peter Levine calls that pendulating. Pendulating, and it's part of his model called somatic experiencing. So the result of trauma is that our window of tolerance, to use Dan Siegel's language, or zone of resilience I like to use, it shrinks. Our window of tolerance or our zone of resilience is not our comfort zone. It's the zone in which we can be in a responsive relational mode with the challenges of our life. And the broader it is, the more intense challenges we can handle still in a relational responsive way instead of getting triggered into fear and survival-based reactivity, right? And when we get triggered out of that zone, we either get triggered down into hypoarousal, we start shutting down, disassociating, or we get triggered into hyperarousal, we go into fight or flight, right? So we go into fight or flight or we go into freeze, right? And that's where outside of our window of tolerance, outside of our zone of resilience. And the impact of trauma, it shrinks that zone. For some people, it gets so bad, they experience agoraphobia. They can't even leave their homes. It's too triggering to even leave their homes. Now, for all of us, all of our windows of tolerance have shrunk over our lifespan. Little kids, when they're two, three years old, it's as wide as the ocean. They're completely uninhibited, bright eyes, fearless. They'll get into anything, which is why we have to keep a close eye on them so they don't hurt themselves, right? But they're fearless, right? And then with the bumps and bruises of life, we start going, well, I'm not going to do that again. Well, that was embarrassing. Well, that, you know, and we start limiting ourselves and limiting ourselves. So even as highly functioning adults, we don't have the same oceanic window of tolerance we had as children, right? So we can all expand that, reclaim more of the bandwidth of our life by leaning into the discomfort of the edges. And meditation practice is really that, right? Any of us who've done retreats, we lean into sitting still, which is uncomfortable, we lean into being with our crazy busy mind and the waves of that. So, you know, really that's what we're doing in meditation practice is we're gradually learning to tolerate greater and greater discomfort, at least in part what we're doing, right? But again, that question about PTSD, most trauma healing modes in some workable, safe way, you're trained or you train yourself to lean in, lean back, lean in that pendulating quality in a, a self-titrating, self-empowered way. So you feel in control and you feel it's workable for you to lean in a little bit to that discomfort, then come back to home base where you feel okay. Lean in, come back. And gradually, we again reopen our window of tolerance or zone of resilience where we can reclaim more of our life and be able to be in a responsive relational mode with more of our life. And fewer things trigger us into either hypoarousal shutting down or hypoarousal acting out, fight or flight. And this approach to practice, I believe, is foundational to all of that. So, yes, I believe it's very helpful for any kind of trauma work. Yeah, somebody put in the uh, link to the Global Resilience Summit. Thank you very much. If anybody has a link to Rick's Summit, please put it in there. I find that pain is a sign of vitality. Yep. Yep. I think reclaiming discomfort and pain, you know, uh, my first teacher, Chogum Trungpa Ramshay, was famous for wearing his belts too tight. 
and his clothing slightly tight because he kind of he, he didn't want to be, you know, it, it was the opposite of like wearing comfortable, you know, sweatsuits around. Right. So we don't have to experience any discomfort. He wanted to feel that sense of, you know, presence. Right. Um, so I think a very one of one of the most powerful strategies for waking up in life is to embrace discomfort. It's easy to embrace comfort and pleasure, right? In fact, that can take us into addictions. And I'm not talking about being masochistic, but just by being willing to be with the natural discomfort and pain that arises in our life, we actually wake ourselves up and we reclaim our dignity and become conscious beings. Let's see. I'm reading some, I'm going to talk about feeling attention. The interesting thing is that during your meditation, I think I finally grokked the notion. Feeling attention, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the organization you got involved in that was somewhat cult-like back in the 70s. There was a lot of that going around. But, you know, some of those probably did some good things too. But at any rate, yeah, feeling attention. I like that word, feeling attention. It's like we're in, in mindfulness practice, we're learning to direct our attention, right? And in, in the scientific literature, they call it attention switching. The ability to notice our attention went over there and bring it back here, right? And we all can do that, but a lot of the time we're not doing it and our attention just running, bouncing around like a ping pong ball, right? right? So the ability to direct our own attention and to do that in a more aware, feeling way, right? Yeah, so I like, I like that term, feeling attention, someone brought in. Yeah, just after coming out with, of a triggered moment, breath. Breath regulation is the key to self-regulation. Breath regulation is the key to self-regulation. Our breath is connected to our autonomic nervous system, which most of you, I'm sure, know has two branches. We have the upregulating sympathetic response, which we need just to be alert, but then we get too much, that goes into fight or flight. And we have the downregulating parasympathetic response, which takes us into rest and recovery mode. If we get way too much parasympathetic and, and no sympathetic, we, we go into freeze response, right? So there's a balance. We're always in the right balance for any human activity where it's responding to a crisis or being in a state of readiness in a job where we might have to deal with crisis or it's just, you know, just being in a relaxed alert state for doing normal activities or whether it's really relaxing to go to sleep at night or being out socially with friends or activities with our family. What is there different? There's a different ideal physiological cognitive state for any activity we're doing and we can learn to self-direct that. If we don't self-direct that, guess who's directing it? The world around us. We live in the interface between our childhood conditioning, which we had nothing to say about, and which is very wired into us, neurobiologically, right? And we live in the interface between that and the world around us. And that can be a pretty bumpy ride sometimes, right? Because the world around us is not all that benevolent much of the time. And it's not personal, it's not out to get us, right? But it is, you know, it can be not so benevolent. And our childhood conditioning sometimes is a bit gnarly, right? So just living unconsciously and mechanically in that space can be a pretty rough ride, but it doesn't have to be that way because we can take ownership for regulating our own physiology. And the modality to do that is the breath, breath awareness. So uh, Ray, Ray, uh, just type yes in if you've heard of something called straw breathing. Type yes in there if you've heard of something called straw breathing. So some yeses, some noes. Okay, so I'm going to teach you straw breathing really quickly. Very simple. For straw breathing, first of all, ideally, it's ideal to breathe diaphragmatically. Some of us become chest breathers. You might just lean back for a minute and notice where you're breathing from. It's a stress response to breathe with these muscles and become chest breathers. It means we're shallow breathers. We're not getting enough oxygen. Many people breathe that way. It's a stress response, it becomes conditioned. But we can retrain ourselves to be belly breathers or diaphragmatic breathers. When you go to sleep at night, place one hand on your chest, one hand on your belly, adjust your pelvis, it's usually how you're holding your body in your pelvic area, and until you notice the hand on the belly is going up and down and the one on the chest is relatively still. Do that every night for a few weeks or a month or two, and you'll regain your ability to be a default belly breather because we already have the neural pathways for belly breathing. That's the natural way to breathe. If you have a dog or cat at home, you watch them taking a nap on the living room rug, belly going up and down. 
your infant, young child in the crib, barely going up and down. That's the way we're intended to breathe. Okay, so then straw breathing, we breathe in through the nose with the mouth closed, and then we breathe out through pursed lips, like we're blowing through a straw, or like we're whistling. In through the nose, go ahead and try it. In through the nose, out through pursed lips. In through the nose, out through pursed lips. In through the nose, out through pursed lips. Keep breathing that way. And now start counting internally. And I'll guide us at first. We're going to breathe in a four count and out an eight count. So breathing in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you get the idea, very simple. The idea is your the out breath is twice as long as the in breath. You could be breathing in a five count, out a six count, in a six count, out a 12 count. What did I say? In a five count, out a 10 count, in a six count, out a 12 count. So the out breath twice as long as the in breath, right? You're breathing in through the nose, out through pursed lips. You can use a straw. I don't have one here, but let's say this was a straw. You can breathe in through the nose, put the straw in your mouth. It takes more effort to blow through a straw. That's going to um, uh, that's going to condition your abdominal muscles for the out breath. Uh, it also does things to the nitrous dioxide levels. But just doing it through pursed lips works quite fine. And you do straw breathing, it automatically engages the parasympathetic branch response. I do it all the time. Before the, before the pandemic, I was a road warrior, a lot of white knuckle trips to the airports, going to security airports. I was you know traveling two, three times a week. And I did straw breathing all the time, kept myself well-regulated, resilient. I get make my flights on time, get to the gate, relaxed, right? Straw breathing, it works. There's also box breathing. A lot of people like that. You can look these up on, on the web very easily. Box breathing, straw breathing. I would really encourage you to, to notice whether you are a diaphragmatic breather and if you're not, retrain yourself to be a diaphragmatic breather and then learn some simple state shifting techniques like straw breathing or box breathing where you can very quickly take yourself from a triggered state back into a resource state. So that was the question about what to do when you're triggered. Right? How many people have heard when you're really angry, count to 10 before you do anything else? Right? Why does that work? Right? We count to 10, we chill out, right? Because the counting distracts us from whatever the trigger is that we're getting triggered by. Also, the reptilian brain, the fight or flight response, like when we're really triggered, we lose access to the neocortex and the fight or flight survival brain reptilian response is in control. And so we're not very smart. We do and say things that are not smart at all when we're emotionally triggered. So that part of our brain can't count. By remembering to count, we regain access to the neocortex where the smart part of our brain is. If we would take a nice deep belly breath with each count, one, two, we would chill out even more, right? So it's really important to learn simple, what I call state shifting techniques to when we recognize that we're emotionally triggered, we can get ourselves untriggered. Because when we're emotionally triggered, we really only have one job, and that's to get untriggered. Because when we're emotionally triggered, as understandable and as reasonable as it may be that we got triggered, we're still triggered. It's our trigger. It's our stuff. And we're a danger to ourselves and others. So we really only have one job at that point. I would encourage everyone to take a simple vow. I will not act when triggered. I will not act when triggered. I will stop, pause, use some state shifting technique, regain access to my neocortex, and make a reasonable objective assessment of what's going on before I act. Right? that'll reduce a lot of suffering from our lives and those of others. Okay, I'm seeing if there are any other big questions. Can you share a recommendation on how to prevent traumatic events situated from be becoming internalized? Yes. So again, being grounded in the body. If we are, if we do experience a primary trauma event, right? There are two points. Primary trauma is when we're literally in an event where we're attacked verbally, emotionally, physically, we witness someone else do it. I work with correctional officers and police, so they're dealing with this kind of stuff all the time. That's primary trauma. Secondary trauma is when we hear about it happening to others. And when we hear about it happening to others, there's some part of our brain that's going, that could have been me. And we're having the same neurochemical experience to a much lesser degree, but that accumulates over time. 
The other type of secondary trauma is when we work around a lot of people on a regular basis who have a lot of trauma in their nervous systems, we absorb it empathically. But when you are experiencing some kind of immediately traumatic event, you know it. First of all, get yourself out of danger. And then it's good if you can sit down and just get in the body and squeeze your thighs, squeeze your legs, squeeze the body, do some self-nurturing things, maybe do some tapping, do some deep breathing, right? Maybe sip some warm tea. Uh, then when you feel more grounded, you could go out and take a walk, breathe fresh air, look at the sky, right? You can dance, put on some music and dance, move like animals. They shake trauma out of their body. But initially, it's helpful to get grounded. And we can do that by squeezing our muscles, right? And tapping, breathing, and so forth. So um, that's very helpful if you're in an actual trauma. As soon as you get yourself out of danger to do that. And then also being with someone else. And, and you know, having someone lit witness you and listen to you and so forth is very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, relational trauma experience. So, you know, the main thing is first get yourself safe, extricate yourself from the, you know, you make a boundary, this doesn't work for me, get yourself out of the situation and then take care of yourself, get yourself into a safe situation. Someone teaches straw foundation for singers. Yeah, there's a lot of people, uh, there's actually some uh, voice coaches, very famous voice coaches who learned how to do some incredibly therapeutic stuff because working with voice and working with breath, it's all it's all interconnected. Yeah. Trying to see if there are any other big questions out there. Yeah, it's just practice like anything else. Somebody said, what's the best approach to having a hard time and to relaxing the breathing as if stopping to pay attention? Yeah, that self-consciousness around breath might, like anything, when we try something new, it can make us a little anxious to begin with. So it's just practice and always being gentle. Anything we're doing, gentleness and non-aggression is the ground of our path and our practice. Any kind of breath stuff we do, if it's simple stuff like straw breathing, that's very benevolent, but still always be gentle, never be ambitious. And if you're going to get into any more advanced pranayama techniques, get good coaching, get good teachers. And still always be gentle, never ambitious. And with our practice, it's always about gentleness. right? It's, there's effort, right? We can make effort, but we do that effort in a non-striving way with gentleness and self-kindness and self-compassion. Okay, I, I don't know if somebody's referencing the stop, feel, uh, breathe, and be. So stop, cut, through discursing, then feel is just dropping into the body and feeling what's ever there. Now, I've actually had to train people in retreats and training I do. You know, I'll have you put your hand out and just focus on your hand for a while and just keep bringing your attention there and your attention there until so you really start to feel the physicality of the hand. You'll start to feel some buzzing and tingling. And the more you keep your attention there, you like to begin to feel the hand physically and energetically. You can do that with any part of the body or just rub the body. I mean, we're talking about physical feeling, but many of us are very out of touch with the body. And I often teach, I'll say, you know, feel, what do you mean feel? I don't, I don't feel, right? So sometimes we have to retrain ourselves to reawaken the body, to reawaken, reawaken that somatic awareness. Okay. All right, well, I think that's enough for tonight. It is 10.30 and it's time to... Uh, to finish and I really again it was uh, an honor to be able to be with you and your community um, and uh, if you're curious about my work it's heartmindinstitute.co and uh, if you want to join the free summit globalresilientsummit.org and I encourage you to check out Rick's summit coming up as well right before ours and um, uh, it's been a pleasure and I really wish you all the very, very best. I'm really glad you all are part of this community and doing these practices. You couldn't have a better guide or teacher than, than Rick Hansen, Dr. Rick Hansen. So you're in good hands. And uh, I wish you all a wonderful evening and a wonderful life and good practice. And please be well. Take good care of yourself. Stay safe and healthy and be well. Thank you so much.